The following nine myths that I'm about to discuss in this video extended my music production journey by five to 10 years. I don't want the same for you. If you spend so long believing something that's a lie to be true, then eventually you'll spend so much time trying to make it true, when in reality that's time you could have just spent getting better at music production. So if you do want to become a great producer the fast way, here are nine dangerous myths that you need to avoid at all costs. Now, if you're a beginner, this video will help set a few things straight, but if you need a more holistic roadmap, make sure to check out our free beginners training. Over 10,000 producers have enrolled in this free training and become more confident, creative, and focused producers as a result. You can sign up for free down below in the description. And with that, let's start with number one. The number one dangerous myth is that stock tools in your door are not good enough to make music with. This makes sense. You pull up a YouTube tutorial with your favorite producer and see that they're using things like Pro-Q3, Pigments, Waves bundles, and whatever other plugins. And naturally, you assume that because they're using those tools and because they're great producers that you need to use those tools as well. There's no real other way to say it except that's just false. You're looking at someone who's been producing for 10, 20 years, a snapshot of where they're at now and you're trying to compare that to where you're at, I can almost guarantee you they did not use nearly as many third-party devices when they started out or were more of a beginner. And besides that, you'll find that despite the, sh the fancy GUIs and nice plugins on their screen, they're probably still using a great deal of stock tools that come with the door they're using. Look at someone like Skrillex who uses a bunch of stock Ableton tools, despite how prolific he is these days. The tools that come with Ableton Live, FL Studio, and Logic Pro X are phenomenal, and they're more than capable of helping you create world-class music. And by focusing on less, you'll actually grow in the right direction and a lot faster. So dive into those nice stock tools, get familiar with them, and you'll be able to make music a lot faster and you'll enjoy the process more. Okay, so number two, is that it's okay to spend months on one song. Now, some people are gonna immediately disagree with me here, and that's fine. This statement seems to make sense on a surface level, right? One quality song is surely better than heaps of average songs. But the assumption here is that working for more time on a song makes it better, whereas nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I have found in my experience working with other producers and in my own music that time spent on a song has nothing to do with the quality. Maybe if you spent five minutes on a song, sure, it might not be good as a song you spent two hours on, but besides that, there's no real difference. Quality only comes through finishing a quantity of music. This is something I preach religiously all the time. <laughs> to give you an example, a track I released a few years ago called Discovery took me maybe five or six hours to make from the initial idea to the final master. And I got a little bit of feedback from the label and they implemented that. I didn't think the track was particularly special, but when they asked for it to be on a compilation, I said yes. Now that song is my best performing song and has over 275,000 streams today on Spotify and is rising by about two to 3K every single day. While I mentioned that, I've also had a lot of music that hits about 10,000 streams after a few months and doesn't really go above that. That I thought was amazing and gonna change the game, so to speak, but it didn't. The lesson here is that you have no control over which songs resonate with your audience. So don't freak out, make music, finish it, get it released and see what happens. And the only way to do that is to not spend months finishing one song. So myth three is that you have to make every sound from scratch. Now there's nothing wrong with sound design. In fact, I've created an entire course on sound design called Breakthrough Sound Design, so I'm a fan. But ultimately your role overall as a producer is to arrange sounds. Not those sounds were explicitly music. created by you is actually irrelevant. I mean, pianists don't make their pianos. Guitarists don't make their guitars. Other people do that for them. Good music is the actual goal here, not the ability to tell someone when you show them your song, oh, I made this sound from scratch. That's just ego. And actually no one cares. Like that's that's the reality of this is they only care if the music is good and that's what you should aim for. So use the presets, samples and other incredible resources out there. But on that note, number four, more plugins, samples and presets aren't necessarily better. It's worth mentioning just because there's so many resources out there, it doesn't mean that you need to hoard them all. I'd rather have one good kick sample that I use in every single track rather than a thousand kick samples that I have to sift through to find one good one. A few short years ago before Splice, you had to purchase an entire sample pack and sift through the samples in that pack to find the things you wanted. But now with Loop Cloud, Splice, Noise and other services, you can curate a deliberate selection of samples that you can use in your own music. 
making your own distinct sonic palette. And as you define your sound more and more, you'll actually find you're gonna be using less and less sounds, which makes sense. The more distinct your sound is, the more curated it will be and less things you'll use to achieve that. Now, this is even more true with third-party plugins. Plugins aren't just resources, they're actual tools. And tools, you have to learn how to use. You can't just drag and drop them in like samples. I like to think of learning a plugin as learning an entirely new digital audio workstation. It's got its own functionality, set of preferences, set of settings, and it's an entirely new environment in and of itself. So to think about that next time, you willy-nilly drag a new plugin into your library. Myth number five is that everything can be learned on YouTube and Google alone. Now, the irony of this, I'm aware, is that you're watching this video on YouTube, probably. But while I'm a huge fan of learning on YouTube and Google, it has one major flaw. Access to information does not equal better music. The search bar in both services puts you in the driver's seat, but what happens when you don't know where you're actually needing to drive? This is why you need a structured path from some other person who's done it before to put you on the right direction with your music production journey. And then you can use YouTube and sprinkle it in there like a supplementary resource, kind of like you know the icing on the cake. What am I talking about when I say a structured path? I mean things like courses, getting a mentor or a coach, some sort of program that's gonna guide you step by step so you don't have to figure out what you need to learn. You're getting it given in one package rather than a tiny piece of it, a la YouTube. As a result, you'll grow faster in the right direction, you'll get help along the way, and you'll be on a quicker path to making the music you wanna be making. Now, speaking of better music, number six is that treatment and or outboard gear are essential to making good music. I mean, again, we see it in studios around the world. They have all this fancy stuff and we think we need that too. But let me tell you a secret. I've been producing for 14 years now and I've never had treatment in my studio. This is partially semantic because I was renting a lot of places and I didn't want to go through the effort of putting up the treatment just to tear it all down a few months later. But mostly is because I actually just didn't want it. I didn't think it would significantly improve anything about my music. And in fact, the producers who I had talked to, who were beginners and put treatment in their room, often were the kinds of people who talked a lot about making music and one of the fancy studios, but never actually did anything. I didn't want to be that kind of producer. I wanted to have results. So I ignored everything that would distract me from that. And that also included a lot of outboard gear. Now I have used outboard gear and do use it a bit now, but it goes through seasons and it's not a staple part of my work. I only use it as a fun creative tool to inject something different. Now, are these things bad? No, treatment's not bad, Apple gear isn't bad, but it is bad if it distracts you from your goal of making music. And often it does. Now, am I open to using treatment in the future? Of course, I'm actually thinking about getting it right now. And of course, studio monitors do sound better in a treated room, there's no doubt. But I actually produce primarily on headphones. I do a little bit of mix referencing on my studio monitors. I do treat my room in the sense I put furniture in, which does a lot of sound dampening. Not perfect, but it does the job. But I use headphones, so I don't really care too much. I'd actually rather my creative space behind me be a place where I feel inspired to make music rather than it be purely an acoustic functionality. Okay, so number seven is that imitating other artists is bad because you need to be unique. We all want to sound unique, so I get it, but we don't actually sound unique by trying to forge some path off in a random direction. Counterintuitively, we actually do it by imitating other artists, picking out the parts of other artists we like and discarding the things we don't. And through a long series of decisions and practicing and making your own music, you'll arrive at a point where you've combined the things you like into something that's truly your own. Although you don't really arrive at your sound, you're actually constantly evolving it anyway, but that's something for a different video. So by emulating your heroes, copying their bass patterns, sample choices, and even song structures, you'll actually learn what works very fast. Myth number eight is that routines are terrible for creativity. Now, this is one of those things that seems to be so widespread, it's not funny. Uh, I don't know where this came from, but actually I found the opposite. I found routines improve my creativity and have improved my skills a great deal more than just winging. People who say like, just feel the vibe, man, don't force it. Might sound controversial, but I don't actually think I've ever finished a song without a degree of forcing it. My natural inclination, I don't know about you, would be just to write a bajillion half songs and keep doing that, never arrange them into fully fledged records. But I don't do that because I want to release my music. <laughs> so yes, I force myself to finish a song, but it doesn't ruin my creativity. In fact, it inspires it and I always feel better for going that extra mile. How does this play out? I try and get in the studio every day as much as possible and work on music, even just for 15 minutes, even if it means I'm working on something for a YouTube video or something. I'm getting in the studio and doing something as much as possible. Am I perfect? 
Not at all. Do I have flexibility in that routine? Absolutely. But you do need a default rhythm, otherwise you can never expect to grow in your skills or your creativity. And you can just make it super simple if need be. 30 minutes, three times a week. 15 minutes, five times a week and then grow it up from there. And lastly, number nine is potentially the most dangerous of them all, which is don't release anything you don't truly love. And this is probably the most challenging stereotype in the entire world of music, that you shouldn't release that song unless you're really, truly 100% happy with it. And again, it seems to make sense on a surface level, but looking back, I don't think I've ever released a song that I'm 100% happy with, truly. Listening back to my other track I mentioned earlier, Discovery, I think the mix is way too bright. I released it, not when it was perfect, but when I thought it was great or good enough. So aim for a great song, sure, but there's a difference between great and 100%. Always gonna be something that's not ideal about your music. My cutoff is to release a song that I overwhelmingly enjoy in spite of its failings. Maybe the certain song I was working on was really tough to mix because of my instrument and sample choice, but the vibe was incredible. So I did the best mix I could, released it, and I'm so thankful I did. Because if I let that 20% of the song that was really frustrating me dictate me not releasing an 80% good song that I knew people would enjoy, that would suck. Once your music's out in the world, it's actually not up to you, it's up to the audience. And if the audience loves it and it connects with them, you can continue to build your music from there and hey, maybe one day you'll make something that you and your audience will like, who knows? So there are nine myths that I think you need to overcome if you're a new producer. Again, these are things that aren't just going to be good mindset shifts, but they'll actually save you time in becoming a good producer. Now, if you are new, again, I really would highly recommend signing up for free for a beginner's masterclass. Why not? It's gonna save you more time. It's gonna put you in the right direction. So check that out in the description below and I'll see you, bye.